Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the FCCJ uh, PAC press conference this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mary Corbett. I am a director on the board of directors of the club. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Toshihide Tsuda, professor, graduate school of environmental and life sciences. He is an expert uh, epidemiologist, and he has worked in the past on numerous cases involving uh, environmental pollution, which have led to diseases uh, and uh, labor uh, problems. Um, Five years after the triple meltdown in Fukushima, there is rising body of evidence that uh, many people exposed to the radiation uh, and under 18 years old at the time are suffering a uh, growing uh, incidence of thyroid cancer. The local authorities and the government ar argue uh, that this is uh, the result of better screening, better and wider screening in the area. However, uh, not much of the data collected to date of 370,000 of these people exposed uh, who were under 18 at the time has been properly analyzed. Uh, Dr. Tsuda has analyzed them. Uh, and he is here today uh, to, to let you know exactly what the numbers are saying. Uh, I think um, we want to have as much time for Q&A, so let's go straight into Dr. Tsuda's uh, talk today. Good afternoon. My name is Tsuda from Okayama University. Thank you so much for so many of you for joining us here today. Uh, since the March 2011 Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident, which came after the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, thyroid screening examinations have been started for all Fukushima residents aged 18 or younger at the time, as of October 2011. And the results of these tests have been made public uh, in both Japanese and English online by the Fukushima Prefecture and also the Fukushima Medical University since February 2013. However, because of the fact that there has been no or non-sufficient epidemiological analysis carried out on this data which has been released, this has led to extremely insufficient conditions for causal inference, for public health and clinical policy planning, for future outlook, and also for information disclosure to residents. And so our group, our team at the Okayama University used extremely standard epidemiological methods to analyze this data which has been released by the Fukushima Prefecture. And we submitted our results of this as an original article to the official journal of the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology. Uh, the journal name is also Epidemiology. And I would like to report here to you that the article was officially accepted and has been just uh, this week published as an early release online. And this article has been made available under open access, so it can be accessed by anyone, anytime, anywhere. So I hope that you can all uh, take a look at this. The Japanese translation has not yet been created, but we hope to be doing this as soon as possible, and we will be releasing this in Japanese also. And within the materials we have distributed today includes the article itself, the original article, and also an e-appendix, uh, which contains various data and information which uh, does not fit into the, the full published article. This has actually not been made available yet to the public, um, but it will hopefully be very soon as well. But these two items have been distributed to those present today. And within these materials includes also an abstract or a summary of the article, which contains um, mostly the same text as is included in the original article itself. The structure or the format of the article is quite simple. And the purpose or the aim of this article is to make quantifiable uh, the various aspects such as the radioactive elements released from the Fukushima nuclear power plant after the earthquake and tsunami in March 2011, and also aspects including the situation or the incidence of thyroid cancer among exposed residences and the uh, cause and effect or causal inference in relation to this. And in regards to methods of the study, uh, it is based on the ultrasound thyroid screenings which were conducted by Fukushima Prefecture on all residents of Fukushima who were 18 or younger at the time of the accident. And the data which is included in, within this study uh, begins from the first screenings which were conducted by Fukushima Prefecture, as I mentioned, from October 2011 through until the second round up to December 31st, 2014. There has been a further announcement of screening results following this in, uh, on March 31st, 2015, and the data and the information from this is included within the e-appendix. 
And in regards to the data which was announced on June the 30th of this year, this is included within the slides which have been distributed today also. And our analysis includes, so these prefectural results from the first two rounds and a comparison of this with the Japanese annual incidents and the incidents within Fukushima prefecture, including also by age and looking at so how many times this uh, involves and also the latency period of the cancer. And as well as the comparison with the national averages, we have also conducted a comparison of the incidents within Fukushima prefecture, so in areas with lower and those with higher rates as well. So a comparison within the prefecture was conducted also. And in regards to the comparison with the overall Japanese annual incidence, we have found that in regards to thyroid cancer, there can be estimated or assumed up to 50 times the amount of thyroid cancer. And even in lower areas within, uh, uh, around 20 times the incidence. In the lowest areas of Fukushima, there has not been a single incidence of cancer found at this stage. And in regards to the lowest area of Fukushima Prefecture, if this was to be taken as the point of comparison or reference, actually because it is at zero, this would mean that in comparison with the other parts of the prefecture, it would um, come to sort of unlimited or infinity in terms of the results. So rather than taking this particular area or this district as the reference point, we have used the second lowest area within the prefecture. And this second lowest area has been uh, shown to be an area where the radioactive plume actually passed around. So this is meaning that it is a relatively or a low contaminated area within the prefecture. And so comparing this second lowest area and the highest area within Fukushima, it is around 2.6 times the difference. And so this is in regards to the first round or the initial screenings which were conducted until the year 2013. And the announcements of the results from the second round, so the round until 2014, is now underway. And in regards to the announced results of this second round, um, even when it is assumed that forms other than thyroid cancer or other cancers are zero, even with this extreme assumption being made, there we are seeing now around 10 times the amount of uh, cases in this round of results. This brings us to the inclusion that as we are seeing such an increase even within this period within Fukushima Prefecture, it is a very similar situation to the results of what was being seen in Chernobyl after the first four years or at around the same time following Chernobyl. And as a result of this, if we look at what happened in Chernobyl in the fifth year and sixth year, for example, when there was an extreme or very much an increase seen in the rates, this means that this situation will most likely be very difficult to avoid here in Japan also. In 2013, the assessment issued by the World Health Organization estimated that there would be an increase in thyroid cancers, leukemia, breast cancers, and other forms of solid cancers even outside the 20 kilometer zone around the Fukushima nuclear power plant. However, the results we are seeing now actually far exceed what was estimated by the WHO. However, this situation in Japan is unfortunately not yet very well understood at all, and there is also not sufficient preparations being put in place in regards to this. So what is necessary now is a full understanding of this situation and what it means, and also policy and measures to be implemented in accordance with this. Even as early as 2013, I announced the data and the results of this at the International Conference of the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, which is held in Switzerland. And at the time, this was covered very thoroughly by the local media. And I also announced the subsequent results at the annual conference, which was held in Seattle in 2014, and also at this year's annual conference, which was held in Brazil. And within this time, I have also both verbally and also through written correspondence conducted uh, various reports and also discussion with experts on this issue. And their uh, common opinion was that this is a very important issue and so they encouraged me to publish an article showing this data and this analysis as soon as possible. And within discussions conducted over mail and directly with them as well, they constantly said that this should be published very soon or published as soon as possible. So as a result, from uh, entering this year, we decided to move faster and to publish this article, which brings us here today. And so this brings on to the conclusion, the overview of the article or the study I would like to share with you today. I would like to have as much time as possible for question and answer. So I will end my presentation here and we can go into the question time, also using some of the slides which I've brought today if there are questions in regards to the data and so on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tudor. So we'll move right into Q&A. Uh, first questions from Working Press only, please. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll, we'll take from others as well. So, uh, questions? 
And please give your name and affiliation. Thank you. So to translate the question, my name is Hirano from Hodo Station. Uh, there was a report yesterday from another scientist saying that this uh, report or this article is too premature. So I would like to ask your opinion on this evaluation. Also, you mentioned that international experts were encouraging you to publish this article much faster because it is very important. And yet we hear that in Japan, it is not fully known or understood. I would like to ask if you think that many other experts in the field uh, in Japan have the same understanding as you or not in the same evaluation, um, also in regards to your co-authors of this article, and if not, then what is the reason for this also? Um, first of all, I would like to say in my exchanges, both in discussion and also with an email with international experts and researchers, there was not a single person who said that this is too premature. Rather, there were actually extremely, or many opinions or many researchers who were saying, you need to do this faster, you need to bring this out sooner. And so therefore, I think actually criticism about why is it so slow for this kind of analysis to come out uh, is actually present. I believe uh, one point is in Japan, especially in comparison with Europe or the United States, the number of experts in epidemiology who conduct analysis on other people's or data or data from other people's studies is extremely low in comparison to overseas. Um, and I believe that this is also a characteristic of the Japanese medical or scientific research field. It's related to various particular historical aspects as well, so it would be a, quite a long explanation if I went into it here, but it is written in detail within my book. And the reason for so many uh, in Okayama University as well also has historical reasons, which many of the uh, those familiar with Japan who are here today are probably aware of the case of uh, Kurashiki and Ohara and so on. However, I would like to say that as well as the four co-authors of this article, there are many other researchers working in this same field at Okayama University. And while in comparison with similar research institutes overseas, perhaps it is not as many researchers. However, on a very regular basis, we are carrying out discussions and so on together with me and the other researchers in regards to this issue. And so within the researchers at university, at Oklahoma University, who I've been conducting these discussions with, there has not been a single person who have said that they are of the opinion that this is too premature. There has also not been a single person who says that they do not see any connection between the nuclear power plant and this increase which we are seeing. So I hope that that answers your question. Questions? Do you have so it seems that the microphone yeah. was not working for part of uh, Dr. Tsuda's announcement of the results. And so there was a question to repeat that part so that the, the cameras and the microphones can take it. So we'll just check which part. That Hi. Was. So we have a request to repeat <clears throat> that section of the conclusion. So, first of all, I would like to demonstrate on this slide very simply. We can see here on the horizontal axis is written the year from 1977 to 93. And the vertical axis is the number of cases, the number of incidences. And this is so the number of cases of thyroid cancer in people under the age of 14. And so what is often missed within the current discussion at the moment is this small number of the increase that we can see here in the circle. And this is an increase which is statistically significant. And so by not recognizing this statistically significant increase, which we can see here in the circle, the Fukushima Medical University and Fukushima Prefecture are saying that we do not have an increase. And so now here on the slide, it says 4.1 years after the accident. We are now actually at 4.5 years after the accident. And this arrow points to the period we are at today. And so here we can see that for those people, the Fukushima residents who were 18 years or under at the time of the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster, we are seeing an increase in 20 to 50 times the number of thyroid cancers. Or rather, this can be estimated. And so this situation of the increase we can see here in the graph will be very unlikely to be avoided here in Japan. However, despite this situation, there is no preparation being put in place and no change in the statements or the way that the situation <coughs> is being presented. And this is the reason that well, uh, this article was written in the first place, and also the reason that the academic journal decided to rush and actually release it so early as well. From the perspective of disclosure of information as well, it's very important to make this public earlier. And so this is information from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we can see here the minimum latency period for thyroid cancer as 2.5 years. And so this is the period before it is uh, detected clinically. And so it actually, as a result of the screenings, it is earlier than this. And in regards to childhood cancers, it is said that the minimum latency period is one year. No. And so the 2.5 years refers to adults, and the one year is for childhood thyroid cancers. This slide is an overview of the contents or the methods of the thyroid cancer screenings which were conducted. 
And so this is an overview of the schedule of the screening. And so in the first year of the screening, so from October 2011, from mid-financial year 2011 through to March 2012, the area which is in pink on this slide uh, was tested. And the screenings was conducted in the yellow area from April 2012 through to the end of March 2013. And the light blue areas refers to those where the screenings were conducted from April 2013 to end of March 2014. And for the year beginning April 2014, the yellow and pink areas are going through to their second round. And so now the second round for the light blue areas is currently underway. And uh, actually the popu population density of the Fukushima prefecture overall is around three times that of Gomel in Belarus, which was an area which had very high incidences of thyroid cancer. And so with more population or the higher population exposed to radiation, this means also a higher number of thyroid cancers to be observed. And this is an explanation of the comparison group, so the mythology used in the test. And the article looks at nine different districts within the prefecture. And the area I referred to as the highest area, so that which could be up to 50 times percent, is number three, the central middle district. And the area I referred to, which has had no cases found, no cases detected at this time, uh, or the least contaminated area, is number nine, the northeastern least contaminated district. And the second lowest area, which even that still has up to or an amount of 19 times, is listed as number seven, the southeastern least contaminated district. And so this is an outline of the methods of how the comparison or the calculation which was being made. It's a very um, basic method for doing this. And we can see the comparison between the overall national or the Japanese mean annual incidence. And here is information about the internal comparison or that which was conducted within Fukushima prefecture, showing the second least or the second lowest area, which was the southeastern least contaminated area and, uh, in terms of the detection numbers. And so the program, the package which was used for the uh, calculation of this is a very basic, a very simple epidemiological package, and which is a package which is released by the CDC to the WHO and researchers all around the world at no cost. And the nine districts can be seen on the map as shown here. This is also in the handouts which are distributed today. This shows the numbers from the first round of tests. And the additional smaller numbers which we're being shown now are those from the second round of tests now underway. And the colors in the tables which are shown on the slides correspond with the colors on the map as well. So we can see here the yellow uh, blocks which are shown here correspond with the testing which was conducted from April 2012 to end of March 13. And this area was divided into four districts. And the smaller numbers being brought up on the screen now are the number of cancer cases which were found in the second round. And this demonstrates here the four districts from the light blue area on the map, which is the area being tested within the April 2013 to end of March 2014 period. And now uh, this round, the second round, is still underway at the moment currently, so this is why we are not seeing a higher number being um, brought up in regards to the results of the second round here. And this, uh, which is demonstrated on the slide here, corresponds with table one in the original article published in the journal. And this, so this shows the ratios of the incidence rate. And the, this, so this file, table four, corresponds with table one in the published article. The next slide, which is table five, corresponds with table two in the published article. And so we can see here the number of 50 for the incidence rate ratio, which corresponds with the highest rate or the highest ratio seen within the results here. And the area where there has been no detection is listed here as the zero, so the final row. And the second lowest is this one, 19.56. And we can see here the nearest area, so that which is listed in pink, is the area closest to the nuclear power plant, and that is close to 30 times the incident rate ratio. And the test period for this area, the nearest area, was from October 2011 to March 2012. So this is actually within one year of the disaster. So this is less than one year, and when we consider this in regards to the cancer latency period. And yet, despite the fact that the testing, the screening for this nearest area was conducted so soon after the disaster, we are still seeing close to 30 times here. This is an extremely important point to note. And so in regards to the yellow area, this of course relates to around one to two years of latency period or a maximum up to two years in this respect as well. And we are seeing these high ratios shown. And the light blue area demonstrates a latency period of two to three years.
And so here we can see similar numbers in terms of the 40 times for the yellow and the purple areas, but because of the difference in the latency period, this has a different meaning. Uh, so we can see the yellow area is actually likely to be higher. When we consider this in relation to the latency period, we can see that this is actually a higher incidence. And this is the ratios from the internal comparison, so within Fukushima Prefecture. And so the area which was the second lowest is listed here as one for the prevalence odds ratio. And so we can see for the area which is located closest to the nuclear power plant, we have the number of 2.58 times. And so when we consider the latency period in regards to this, this could quite easily be explained by its proximity or its connection to the nuclear power plant. And this shows the plans for the second round. And so this has already been announced here. However, the 2015 results have almost uh, not at all yet been announced. And the breakdown of the results from financial year 2014 can be seen on this slide. And so within the article, it's actually eight Thanks. cases. Within the e-appendix, it's 15. But here we can see 25 in the most recent um, results. And so here, when we look at the second round results here, and we see going up to the IRR of 55.4, this shows that we are on a very similar trend to that which can be seen of the, sh the curve from Chernobyl. So from when the first cases were de uh, detected, it could have been estimated that we would see very similar pattern or similar trends to that which did occur in Chernobyl. And indeed, when we look at the results here, this is exactly what we are seeing now. Therefore, also we can assume that there will be likely to be a similar curve seen from now as well and also a similar increase in result. However, we are not only seeing no measures being put in place for this as well, we are also seeing no announcements at all in regards to this. This is of course leading to more mistrust or uh, uncertainty for the residents and also meaning that there is likelihood that the administration or the local governments will also not be able to function in response. And so now we must as soon as possible look at ways to change the way that this is being referred to, spoken about, and also to implement measures to deal with this as soon as possible. Thank you. We'll take more questions. Uh, my name is Ian Thomas Ash, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and a member of this club. Uh, I made a film called A2BC uh, three years ago, which is about uh, the issue of children's thyroids and the concern of parents. Uh, the parents at the time, three years ago, when they expressed a concern about these issues, they were told that they were crazy, that they were uh, worrying too much, and that there was no data to prove uh, anything about their concerns. Um, we all know that it takes years to have these kind of peer-reviewed studies. Uh, the work that you're doing is extremely important. I'm looking forward to your continuing work. My question to you, however, is um, would you have recommended five years ago or four and a half years ago that uh, more was done uh, to protect children while it was trying to be discovered what was happening. Could this have been predicted? Yes, I believe that there are many things which should have been done, could have been done at the time. Even at the time of the disaster, when we looked at what most experts were saying, when we looked at the ratio of the number of radioactive materials dispersed in the atmosphere in comparison with Fukushima, we could also at that time have assumed that we would probably or likely see thyroid cancers in Fukushima as well. So this could have been... Uh, expected from that time. However, we are now seeing an even higher pace uh, being observed now as well, which means that we also should be evaluating, actually, perhaps there was even more release of radioactive materials and exposure uh, to radiation for the people. No. However, so when the announcement or the official announcement was made that the radioactive materials dispersed were uh, one-tenth, there was, of course, many things which could have been done even before that and things which could have been done at the time when this announcement was made. For example, if uh, iodine had been distributed to children who were affected at the time exposed, then it could be expected that the number of thyroid cancers could have been reduced by up to half. Therefore, I think it can be said that the experience of Chernobyl has not been utilized or barely been utilized at all here in Japan. And so in 2012, the WHO conducted their preliminary uh, dose estimate. And then in, based on this in 2013, they issued this health risk assessment, which can be seen in the slide here, showing the expected increase in thyroid cancer for uh, those who are one year old at the time. And the dark blue area on this graph demonstrates the WHO's assessed or expected increase. However, at the time when the draft for the uh, estimated or preliminary dose estimate was issued by the WHO in 2012, due to lobbying by the Japanese government at the time, actually the dose which was included by the WHO was reduced following this. 
And according to reporting which was issued on December 7th of last year, so in 2014, as a result of this lobbying by the Japanese government, actually the estimated dose which was uh, listed within the uh, WHO's uh, uh, assessment was actually one third to one tenth less of what it had originally included in its draft. Which shows to us that actually this lobbying was doing exactly the opposite of what should have been done at that time, what measures should have been put in place. And I believe that it is necessary or the Japanese government should conduct an investigation of what actually really happened and the contents of what was reported at the end of last year. Does this answer your question? Um, okay, I think we had a lady in the middle and then you. Five more minutes? Okay. Uh, hello, I'm from the Tokyo Shimbun, the Tokyo newspaper. I would like to ask, of course, the Fukushima Prefecture and their committee is referring to a potential overdiagnosis or screening effect in regards to why these numbers are so high. I would like to ask, if this is the case, what kind of percentage or ratio could be accounted by these kinds of factors? And if you have any numbers available in regards to this? And if this possibility is excluded, what kind of numbers would we be looking at? I would also like to ask the source of your statistics for the national means and also uh, the numbers there too. So first of all, I would like to point out that those uh, researchers who are referring to potential screening effects or overdiagnosis, I don't believe that they have actually looked at any kinds of articles or data which could show well, what kind of ratio could actually be responsible or could these kind of factors be responsible for. And so I actually hope that if you, or when we hear uh, researchers talking about potential screening effects or overdiagnosis, we should actually be asking them, well, if you think that this is the case, well, what kind of ratio do you believe could be expected to be accounted for as a result of such factors? And ask them to be showing the data or the research which can demonstrate this. And the data which is available for this is only showing well, two to three percent uh, times or six to seven times at most. So one digit in regards to what could be accounted for as a result of such factors. However, the increase we are seeing in Fukushima Prefecture is up to levels of 20 to 50 times. So it's actually, it's a whole digit more than this, a whole figure more. Therefore, even if a screening uh, effect does exist, it can only account for a very small percentage of this, a very small ratio. And so this information on the slide here is included within the abstract, uh, not within the full article, but I would like to refer to a point here. And so this slide refers to the screening by ultrasound which was conducted in Chernobyl by children who were born one year after the disaster and or in our relatively low contaminated areas. And there was a total of 47,203 children who were uh, screened in this way. And within these 47,203 children who were screened at this time, there was not a single case of thyroid cancer found. This data is included within the latter part of the E appendix distributed today. And so this is being used as the, uh, the reasoning for uh, claiming that there is not an increase in thyroid cancer for children who were born after the disaster at this time. However, these figures, this uh, screening or this uh, investigation is not being referred to at all here in Japan. We're often hearing in Japan sayings that well, this is the first time a screening has been conducted on such a scale of tens of thousands of people. This has not been done anywhere before. However, we can see here actually the number of tens of thousands of people screened in Chernobyl uh, does very much show that this, there is a precedent. And so the announcements are being made in Japan without learning from the experience of Chernobyl and also without referring to the kind of evidence that already exists about the effects of radiation on the human body, human health. Does this answer your question? Hmm? And in regards to the source of the information regarding the national mean, uh, this is taken from uh, data by the National Cancer Center of Japan. It's available on their homepage as well, which shows that the average instance of thyroid cancer for those under the age of 19 is around 2.3 per 1 million people. Siegfried Nittel, writing for the Austrian newspaper, Der Standard. Um, I heard or I read the uh, um, that some people say your research is different, perhaps more modern than other kind of research. So the result of, uh, of your research to former uh, research is different because you use a more modern uh, kind of uh, research. Uh, my method, methods uh, implemented in this research are not any particular modern methods. They are exactly what is written in any kind of textbook about this issue, these methods. 
And within Japan, Japanese people, at least, there has not, or I have not had anyone to make this kind of direct criticism、えー、to me until now. If you do hear any criticism of mythology or my studies and so on, I would like to ask you please refer them to me directly, and I will be happy to have any opportunity to discuss this with them directly also. <laughs> this in. <laughs> we can say, well, this is what we can say behind your back. We can say. And this actually relates to、uh, issues with the Japanese health and medical policy making methods, and even a lot of it is based on rumors or things happening behind their backs or discussions like this, things being talked about in corridors rather than being based on medical evidence or articles or empirical research and so on. And this is one of the reasons for the various delays or problems within the Japanese health and medical policy situation today, also. One more, is one more question okay? フリーランスの鈴木と言いますよろしく。I'm a freelance researcher. My name is Suzuki.、Uh, within researching or reporting on Fukushima, of course, while being aware of the dangers, there are many people who question about, well, they have no choice but to continue living there, or what should they be doing if they are continuing to live in Fukushima?、Uh, you mentioned that there are no preparations or measures being made in place to this, but unfortunately for many residents, of course, they have to deal with the situation of being in Fukushima. So, what would you recommend for them to do as residents, and what kind of measures should be put in place? Within the field of industrial medicine, there is a legal,、um, compu- or it is legally compulsory for any worker when they are taking on a new job to undergo detailed education about the potential risks involved within that work. Thus, even if no measures are being put in place, even just by making detailed information available to people, also reduces by a huge factor the amount of unnecessary exposure or danger. However, within Fukushima Prefecture and indeed within Japan as a whole at the moment, the only announcement which is continually being made is that at levels of less than 100 millisieverts per year, there will be no cancer, there is no danger. There is no detailed explanation of this kind of information being made, and the kind of information which everybody is aware of, for example, that the impact of radiation on people is more the younger you are, is something which is not being explained at all in official announcements. And if even just this very small, very basic information knowledge could be conveyed, could be taught, then there are many different detailed things which are very small details which can be made as changes as well at even no cost. Furthermore, the radiation exposure or the、uh, levels varies、uh, very much according to location, according to the place. Therefore, by investigating and determining those areas which are at a much higher dose, higher levels of radiation, and as a result deciding to spend less time there, less time in the highly contaminated areas, even that can make a huge difference. So, there are many, many methods to ensure that there would be no unnecessary exposure to radiation, and this can be done at no cost, and yet, education and implementation of this is completely not happening. And this kind of information must be given even more to those people who are living in Fukushima or have no choice to remain in Fukushima. They deserve even more to be, have access to this kind of information. Okay, last question from this lady.、Uh, hello, I'm from TBS、uh, News 2 3. I have three questions. First of all, in regards to the analysis which was announced in this article, I would like to ask if this demonstrates also a linkage between the incidence、uh, of cancer and also the dosage or the contamination levels. The next point is in regards to、uh, your point that we can expect similar trends as was seen after Chernobyl. I would like to ask if the reason for this is because of the、uh, very high incidence rate which is demonstrated or what the reason for expecting the same、uh, as occurred in Chernobyl. And the third point is I would like to ask specifically if you could name the、uh, city or town names of those places which were referred to as the 50 times, 19 times, and so on. In relation to your first question,、uh, as was explained before, the latency period is different according to the color of the area, so the pink, yellow, and blue. Even if adjustment is made for this, an adjustment also made according to the information which is available about the movement or direction of the radioactive plume following the disaster, we can see、uh, the higher concentration within the southern area. And even、uh, once we adjust for these particular aspects in regards to the results of this analysis, we can see actually a very clear relationship between、uh, the factors of the incidence. And the contamination levels or dosage. I do not have those figures available with me today. However, in articles which were published in the Iwanami, Iwanami Publishers、uh, scientific journal called Kagaku, there, are two, or there have been two articles published、uh, specifically on this issue. And so, first of all, in regards to the Chernobyl curve, which was uh, displayed, uh, the case of Chernobyl is the only example we have of such a large scale exposure to radiation of the whole population of an area. And Fukushima is, of course, the second such example. 
And so if we compare the incidence uh, of thyroid cancers in Chernobyl within the first four years following the disaster there, and in comparison to the case of Fukushima at around the same uh, time period, we can see in the case of Japan there is uh, more, in fact, actually 20 to 50 times in comparison to the overall Japanese mean. And however, we have not actually reached the average latency period for thyroid cancer. We are only still at the minimum latency period. So therefore, if we look at the current incidence rate we are seeing here in Fukushima and compare this with the Chernobyl curve as demonstrated, would there actually be anybody who would say that there is not likely to be a similar curve or a similar situation observed in Japan? So in regards to the third question uh, regarding the districts, the pink area, um, because it has actually a lower population or lower population density, this was con uh, kept as one district within our research analysis also. And the yellow and blue areas have relatively higher populations, and so they were divided into four areas each. As you are likely aware, there are three or four uh, highly populated cities within Fukushima Prefecture. One is Fukushima City, which is here, as I'm showing. The second, Kodiyama City. The third being Iwaki City, which has the highest population. And here is the city of Aizu Wakamatsu. And so this was taken into account in a very straightforward way in terms of dividing the districts. And we can see here, so this uh, one in the top northern area, the north middle district, has Fukushima City and the two local municipalities north of that. Kodiyama City and Iwaki City both have very high populations of their own, so they were taken as uh, single districts within this study. And so this determines the nine areas. And so the city, or the area which is referred to as three central mid middle district contains two cities and two towns. Um, sorry to correct that. Two cities, one town and one village according to the local determinations. And so I believe that this of course shows you clearly which areas this refers to. And number nine, although it is not written on this slide, refers to Soma city and Shinchi town. Unfortunately, I don't think we can take any more questions, but I think the professor might have a few minutes. Uh, Chosan, do we have a, a meeting room or anything? Or while, while we're cleaning up, maybe the professor can take a few more questions from the... Okay, so uh, if the professor has time, please stay a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, yes, the professor has some time, so I think he can take some individual questions, but unfortunately we have to um, clear the room soon, so uh, we have to bring this session to a close. Um, I would like to thank the uh, professor very much for the very insightful analysis that he brought to us today. And as is our tradition, I would like to present uh, Dr. Tsuda with um, an honorary membership card and hopefully we can continue this debate and maybe we can have some of the public officials come and debate you here sometime. We'd like to hear the official uh, account of the, of the details presented today. Thank you very much.